So we're going to remove them. So welcome Ted Ho from uh, HP Labs. Uh, Ted has a background in business and computer science. And degrees from Caltech and Stanford. Uh, Ted, today we'll be talking about reputation mechanisms for electronic commerce. Ted. Thank you very much for the invitation. And um, if you have questions along the way, feel free to, to, to bring them up. What I'd like to just to start with is just to give a context of reputation in sort of an area that I'm sure we're all very familiar with if you've ever had the opportunity of buying a used car, particularly from a private dealer. And you face this question of how do you tell if it's a good, if it's a good car or not? And you have various options, particularly if you're not that mechanically inclined. Uh, you can pay someone uh, to, to help you out, um, threaten to go to court if you get a bad deal, and, 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 and so on. But another and sometimes easier way is rely on the reputation of the seller if they've done this um, kind of transaction many times uh, in the past. And that's really what we're going to focus on uh, today, is looking at different reputation mechanisms. Fundamentally, this problem, such as bu buying a used car from someone who knows quite well how the car runs, but you don't, um, is an issue of information asymmetry. And this basically just means that two people are thinking they might have a beneficial transaction, such as getting rid of an old, old car, um, one person knows a lot more about this um, product or service than, than the, other do, the other person does. And because of the concern that you might be buying a lemon, people might be inhibited from entering into uh, these potentially beneficial trades, the market collapses, goes away, and essentially people end up leaving profitable trades uh, on the table if they're not comfortable in um, assuming that they'll uh, get an honest, an honest transaction. There's a variety of examples in, this, in a more modern context than, than buying cars. Uh, things like, I'm a business and I have um, web ads, and is someone clicking on my ad, is that really a customer or, or, or some um, one trying to, a robot trying to waste my ad budget? Um, is some software I'm thinking of downloading, is it full of bugs and, and viruses and spyware, or is it really useful um, as, uh, as advertised? So, so uh, the, the issue of reputation and information asymmetry comes up in you what might, you might call the old economy, and that's the, the buying the, the car example, and also very much in the internet uh, economy. And what I'm then going to be describing in this, uh, in this talk is basically what is the economic challenge for which reputation mechanisms can, can be helpful. I'll describe just as some motivating examples some information services that the internet can, pr can provide that re require people to feel comfortable both in the providing and their using um, of, of information and for which reputation can be helpful. You're probably all familiar with a lot of the more web-based uh, examples, and so I'll, I'll describe some, some other kinds of instances where there's a lot of potential benefit, but people can be afraid of sharing information uh, more, more from the physical world. Uh, and then turn to looking at what are some various kinds of reputation mechanisms and how do we go about evaluating them. And finally, I'll describe some experiments that we've done at HP in comparing a number of different reputation contexts in very controlled, um, although small, in environments. So the economic challenge for a reputation mechanism is we'd like to induce honest behavior among people um, when they have the temptation to cheat because they have some information that the other uh, party to the transaction does not have. Um, and the idea is that a good mechanism should help reduce the consequences of this information a asymmetry so that the people feel comfortable uh, making a transaction even though they know that they're, lim they're, they're lacking some information. And reputation is one way of, of going about, uh, about this. Um, and it's not the only way, but it has advantages of avoiding the, the really uh, potentially expensive costs of detailed monitoring um, or after the fact uh, legal enforcement. So if you can uh, prevent the problem in the first place, it's a lot better than, than trying to fix it afterwards. It's important to understand as we talk about reputation that human nature is still, is still very much the same. The difficulty of enforcing contracts or encouraging people to behave as they, as they promise is certainly not, uh, not something that, that's new. Um, in, in particular, um, interesting example of um, in the Middle Ages, merchants had to deal with this. 
who had lots of profitable trades between different countries, but say a merchant from France couldn't really trust that the king of England and their courts would give them a fair deal if they, if they had to have, had, have some dispute. So they often faced issues of, how can I trust someone when I don't really have clear access to um, legal uh, in, in contract enforcement? The idea of reputation is, is really very simple, and that is you, you give some record of, let's say, my past behavior in, in various similar transactions um, as some presumption of how I will behave in the future, realizing that any poor behavior on my part um, could be punished by the loss of, of future business rather than, say, being dragged off to court um, you know, right, at, right for that particular transaction. And then a question that comes up is, in this broad context, how might we go about designing effective reputation mechanisms um, for, for various situations, and hopefully that are easy to implement and, and use? Now, it's important to remember that when we talk about human behavior and mechanisms and incentives, that when you put a mechanism in place, it can change the way people behave. They're not just you know, static um, uh, with, with fixed behaviors. And so here is just one example. It's not particularly related to reputation. Um, but you might think about your behavior, if, if, it, if you're all similar, similar to me, in the question of whether you bother to put links to other web pages you find, um, you, you find that are interesting. Um, so I remember very, very early on in, in the web, you would find interesting pages, and you'd put links to them, and so on. And then after, after a while, those web pages go away. Or they change their URLs, and they're hard to find. And it becomes a real pain to maintain your own web page when other things that you um, link to keep, keep changing. And so now, hey, there's great search engines. You don't need to bother to put in links. Um, you can let people just give a little text summary and let people find it if they want via, via search engine. That will be up to date, and you don't have to worry about updating your web pages um, so much. Of course, the problem then can come if people rely on search engines rather than, than putting in links. You're no longer um, pr pr presenting that information of endorsements, if you like, by having people explicitly put in um, links, uh, links to, to their pages. And if many people then adopt this, um, this, this kind of attitude, uh, there will be fewer links. Maybe it's harder to search and harder, harder if for, um, for, for mechanisms that rely on the recommendations from, from links. And so this is just as an example of where you, you change a technology, you change a, a mechanism, it could change people's behavior to possibly make that mechanism less, less effective. And it's, it's useful to keep that in mind in any kind of um, mechanism design. And so before we talk more about you know, specifics of mechanisms and economics and so on, I'd like to just put the, uh, the context of a design into three um, different categories, and often people tend to focus on just one of these three. And I think it's important to keep in mind all of them and let them balance off against each other. So if you have a car in, in the parking lot, you know, one thing you'll typically do is lock the door you know, when, when you leave. And that's an example of a simple you know, technology, a lock, um, that makes it harder for people to break in your car and, 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 and steal stuff. Um, Another way, of course, is just don't leave valuable things sitting around in, in plain view in, in your car. You're trying to take away the incentive. Someone could break in, but they have no particular reason to, to do so. So that's more of an economic you know, kind, kind of issue. And finally, there is an, a level of legal sanctions. Yes, you could break in my car and, and, and steal stuff, but potentially the police could come after you. And if you get caught, you, you could be punished. These Various approaches to trying to encourage, if you like, correct or honest behavior have their strengths and weaknesses. And it's important not to just focus on just one of them um, and think that will solve, uh, will, will solve everything. The focus I'm going to be talking about today is more on the, in, in the economic and in, in incentive context, but realizing that technology, in particular cryptographic tools, um, in, in terms of providing who has access to what information, can be an important component of um, uh, reputation mechanisms and maintaining privacy and so on. So now let's look a bit at some information services. And, and I've just picked a few here, first that you'll be very familiar with. Those are based on, on the web. And then I'm tossed in a few that are probably a little bit less familiar with you, with, um, to, to you. And they're not so common yet, although they provide some examples of some interesting searches that is so far beyond current technologies but might be very interesting and have a key trust issue in terms of, uh, uh, in terms of, of um, releasing and using the information, which is what I want to focus on here instead of the technological uh, aspects. 
So of course, we're all familiar with the internet allowing new sorts of, of information services, particularly by lowering drastically the transaction costs. So if you want to find some specialized, obscure information, who wants to sell some, some obscure item that you're interested in, um, or if you'd like to aggregate information from lots of different places, uh, the internet makes that much, much easier than it, than it has been in the past, and then therefore enabling new sorts of services at um, reasonable prices for people. Now, information sources, when we think about the internet and so on, often focus on online sources. What sorts of search activities do people have? What do they put on their web pages? What do they email and, and, and so on? Um, who do they link to in, their, in, in social networks? But there's also a variety of, of interesting possibilities and developing possibilities in, in the physical world for gaining information about the physical world and bringing this into um, online new, new sorts of services. In particular, surveillance sensors, cameras all around, whether they're the government's cameras or our, our own uh, cameras and cell phones and, and, and so on. Um, who gets to know where, where your cell phone is all the time? So it's cell phone locations tied to you. Um, and interestingly, for, for some new kinds of aggregate searches, some medical information. And let me just, because that only thing will be a little bit less familiar to you, just want to go a little bit over what we might imagine some kind of searches that really rely on trust and information and not just, uh, and not just because they're enabled by, by the technology. So if we have lots of distributed sensors and we're interested in environmental monitoring, and we could do this very cheaply and, and continuously and so on. We could monitor for chemicals that people are actually exposed to, for how long, how much, and, and, and so on. And then correlate, to, say, disease outcomes with actual exposures and, not, and perhaps the specific genetic makeup of, of these people and not have to make some more coarse-grained kind of inferences that we have to do um, today. So this could be particularly useful um, for the early identification of some say, environmental toxins that are particularly of a problem but to a very small minority of, of the population just because of their, their, their particular um, profile. That would otherwise take a long time to, to figure out. Another place that we could gather some interesting information, although, again, this is not what's happening, what's happening yet, are these various implants that variety of uh, companies are working on and, uh, and in fact, marketing uh, today. So these are various devices that are implanted, say, to monitor your heart or your blood, blood pressure um, or how a, a bone is healing. And these generally will, will be useful to give information to the, to the physician treating that particular problem of how a treatment is going, is it getting better or worse, and, 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 and so on. Um, and these can give much more detailed information because it can collect information continuously than you would get, say, if you go to the doctor once a week or, 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 or once a month. Now, another area that I'm particularly interested in, in and at HP Labs working on molecular scale devices, uh, and that is sort of molecular computers and, and sensors and so on, is, is taking the, this kind of capability that we already see at, at sort of scales about this size and, or millimeter scales and developing the technologies that make this much, much, much smaller so to be able to sense, compute, act um, on size scales particularly relevant for, for biology, say the, the, size, the size of cells. And here is kind of a, a schematic diagram of this, the, the kind of sizes that, that we're thinking of for applications of molecular electronics that's in the laboratory today, although we're nowhere near able to build these kind of devices and, um, and put them into, into clinical, to, to clinical use. So the, the, the example here is just a, a making a, a very small device that's a little bit smaller, smaller than cells. Yes? What does this have to do with reputation management? Um, I'm getting to that. It's a good, good, good question. So these sorts of implant devices are normally thought of to, to help you interact with your physician, and that's, and that's it. So that, that would, help, would, would help you. Um, but these sorts of devices, if the information was widely shared, could also be used to provide detailed studies of, as I mentioned, environmental monitoring, who's, who's particularly um, uh, sensitive to certain, certain kinds of exposures, and Here's a potentially interesting search that is just impossible to do today, um, partly because of trust issues. And that is, if you have these people with their various implants measuring diabetics, blood pressure, exposure to various toxins, mainly for their own benefit, if that information could be widely uh, searched and available and so on, it could also make possible virtual, very rapid, online, studies for you come into your doctor's office, you're presented with some kind of flu, perhaps, or something, 
see what that is, see how people with your genetic makeup have responded to that, uh, uh, with, to various treatments of that particular, um, particular problem. If you could do it quickly, if you could do it accurately, and you could do it a sample over a large population, just imagine that the kinds of, of things of how that could change the, speci the specificity of, say, medical practice uh, as, uh, that, that we know of today. So this is a, an example of a kind of search that might be very obvious. I'd like to know who else that's similar to you in the relevant characteristics have had this particular problem that you're presenting to me as a physician. What has worked for them? What have other people tried and so on? Can I find this out very quickly? And the answer today is no, um, partly for technological reasons, but also partly for trust, you know, trust issues. What will happen to this information? So the idea of aggregating information, <clears throat> of course, can provide a combination of information that can, pro that can provide improved services. Um, if you can use not only your own behavior, but behavior of similar people to you, whether it's because they're similar medically, or they're similar in terms of the searches that they've looked at, or the similar hobbies, whatever the, whatever the similarity might be, you could get better recommendations, better information um, for them. But of course, and here's where, we, where we, this issue of trust comes in, all this collected information, easily searched and so on, could also be misused, um, you know, for, for example, to enable a really detailed uh, kind, kind of identity theft uh, that people would know a lot about you potentially. And so this is just an example that I, I wanted to bring up because it's somewhat, somewhat unusual when we think about say, just, just web-based web -based services that there are certain kinds of searches that would be nice to have and nice to be able to do quickly, but for which trust is a really key blocker. If, if people, even if the technology were available, trust for, for people to have this information provided and, and, and so on can be a really a, a key blocker. And so as we think about reputation mechanisms, it's not just for finding a better car or finding a better apartment to live in or whether I should download this particular piece of software. There's a wider context uh, to it, which I, I think uh, raises a lot of interesting uh, questions. So I hope that's, uh, that, that helped at least sort of give some, some uh, context of why we should look at things that include collecting information from, from the physical world. So now let's turn a little bit more to the questions of, of um, reputation and why trust is not important for, for when we aggregate or collect information sources. So if we're going to have um, some services that, that based on getting information that's a, a, that people voluntarily, voluntarily give, people have to trust however this information will be, is, is going to be used enough so that they're willing to provide the information. And of course, on the other side, if you're a user of the information, you want it to be accurate, and it's not just some spoof uh, or, or spam and so on. You have to feel that the information is reliable. So here I'm pointing out that there's asymmetric information potentially on both sides of a transaction here. One is I'm going to give you some information. You promise that it will only be used for these various um, uh, uses that, that you promise and not for anything else. Can I trust that? On the other side, as a user of this information, I get something that gives me a recommendation. Uh, can I trust it? Is, is the information um, reliable? So asymmetric information is not just on the seller side necessarily. It can, it can be on, on both. And so if we can devise good reputation mechanisms and understand what makes them work and, and, and so on, it can be a key enabler for a variety of new services for which the technology may not be mature enough yet. Um, but when it's, when it's there, we don't want to just be stopped by everyone loves the technology, but no one trusts it, and so um, they're not going to use it, or they'll um, lobby to pass legislation that restricts it in various uh, ways that makes it less useful than it could be. Now, the internet has both positive and negative consequences for designing reputation mechanisms. And the obvious one is that it certainly can help um, by making a lot more information available about, say, a, a seller. What have they done in the past? How do their other customers feel about them? And, and, and so on. It's a lot easier to find that. Um, you know, an example is the, the eBay rating system, if, if any of you are, are familiar with um, or, or uh, buy or sell things on, on eBay. Similarly with, with social networks, where you can get recommendations from friends of friends, and you might find those more trustworthy than just some, some random ones. The internet also provides challenges for, for reputation mechanisms compared to what, what we might be used to traditionally. Um, in particular, you might be dealing with people in very different legal um, jurisdictions. Um, this is, so this is, again, similar to what these medieval merchants were dealing with. If you're, in, in Fr if you're French and you, you don't trust whether the legal system in England, say, will, will um, uh, help, help you. There might be anonymous users. 
you might not know exactly who, who it is you're dealing with uh, or if you've dealt with them in the past or who they've dealt with in, in the past. You might be doing a, a transaction across different business cultures where sort of different levels, if you like, of bargaining, cheating, whatever you, 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 care, to, you care to call it, are the norms. And how do, you, how do you deal with that? And also, you might be dealing with very small transactions. So it's, imagine buying a, a small thing on, on eBay where it's just not worth the hassle of thinking of going to small claims court if it doesn't work out. And so these are kinds of things that make many of the kind of traditional ways we think of dealing with reputation a little bit uh, uh, more, of a, more of a challenge. If we're thinking of putting together uh, some possible reputation mechanisms, well, we would certainly like the information that we're going to use and, and uh, help people uh, make, make their decisions be easy to collect not, um, and not require very much effort, if any, on the, on the part of the person providing the information. We'd like the information to be accurate um, so that it, I can't easily, if, if, if I'm competing with someone else to sell, to, you know, to sell something on eBay, that I can't easily spoof their reputation and make it seem like they cheat uh, a lot, where, whereas, I, whereas I don't. Because we'd like to encourage people to rely on the reputation and then see what are the consequences for improving and uh, allow, or facilitating transactions that without a reputation mechanism, people would feel uncomfortable uh, doing. And then also, it would be nice if we, if we could have some minimal intrusiveness um, for, for the people whose information we're, we're, we're collecting to maintain privacy. Um, and hopefully, if, if people are concerned about privacy and would either withhold the information or distort or change their behavior because of, uh, because of that, uh, perhaps in ways that, again, make transactions that would be beneficial just not happen uh, because people are concerned about what trail of reputation they, they might be um, uh, leaving behind. And a simple kind of example is if you're involved in transactions that some part of society or some other part, you know, some other society might view as unpopular, maybe you don't want everyone to know about that. Um, so all the gambling you did in Las Vegas, you know, you know, for example, th things, things along those lines. And again, when you're crossing cultural and legal boundaries, something that might be perfectly fine in one um, context might not be in another. And uh, how does that affect um, uh, reputations if you're thinking of doing business in many different, uh, different cultures. Or we see this also with, um, with, with, with search terms uh, indicating something about you, perhaps. So the amount of reputation information that we want is kind of a balancing act. If you have too little, people will not feel constrained by the mechanism. There'll be free writing, cheating, and so on. And then people might feel I can't tell whether what I'm going to get is a good thing or a lemon, and so I just will stay out of the market. The transactions don't happen. In the extreme, the market collapses, and, and there's a, a loss for everybody. If there's too much, it can be co costly to collect. Maybe you have to verify it, which, which, which is costly. Maybe it's just even confusing to users to show hundreds of transactions and whether the person liked it or not, or was, or was a little bit OK and not so OK, or rated, different rating scores. Too much information can also be confusing. Uh, and also then, as I mentioned, uh, privacy concerns. One issue that comes up is, should the information be verified independently, or it's just self-reporting? So third-party verification can you know, make people feel more confident about the accuracy. Um, and it also has the, the disadvantages that it could be costly. You might, someone has to pay or motivate this, this third party. Um, and perhaps forces some uniform evaluation criteria that may not be suitable for, you know, um, for, for everyone. On the other hand, it's self-reporting. So I just decide we have a transaction, and I just post a little thing on the, on the net that says, I like this transaction, or I didn't like it. Um, that, that can be fine. That can be very easy. But on the other hand, there's, I don't necessarily have to tell the truth about it. Um, and what sort of incentives are there for me to misrepresent what happened in, in the, tran the transaction? So as we then think of evaluating different proposed um, mechanisms, uh, in, in looking at economic mechanisms in, in particular, but any, anything in which involve, with, involve people, there's really basically three broad, broad categories. Um, if you're an academic, you might l look at game theory. And this, this has a lot of um, general assumptions about the rationality of the actors and what they know and what they believe about other people and, and, and so on. Um, and that can give some idea of, well, if there is some kind of equilibrium behavior to this mechanism, would it be a good one or not, and, and what, what might be the consequences? 
Then there can be field studies. And you might say, well, let's look at some reputation mechanisms in use, say, you know, particularly say, on, on different websites, um, to have a look at actual behavior, not necessarily rational people, but just you have large numbers of people involved, uh, and see what, what happens. Now, generally, you don't, in a situation like that, you don't get to design the mechanism. You just have to look at whatever it is, say, that eBay decides to do. Um, and because of that, you can get correlations, but you can't get causation. You don't have the ability to go in and say, well, let's just tweak this mechanism a little bit and, and see what happens, um, or change the information that, that people have, and, and, and so on. This actually is a, a, a familiar gripe in biological experiments as, as well, as you can, you can monitor, say, the behavior of, of some cells and watch what things seem to be correlated. But unless you can do experiments where you can intervene and make, and make controlled changes, it's very hard to get, an, get from co correlation to, to causation. So the third kind of approach are particularly uh, are experiments where you can do intervention studies. Um, you can look at counterfactual scenarios that no one would be crazy enough to actually implement. Maybe they'd lose lots and lots of money. Um, but that way, you're able to test a wider variety of, of, of hypotheses. These, these experiments can be web-based, or the ones that I'll be des describing are laboratory-based, where you have a, a lot of control over what information different people have. Um, but on the other hand, they're limited in time and how many people uh, are, are involved. So I would think none of these three uh, methods are clearly better than, than, than the others. They each have, some, have something to, to contribute. They have their, their strengths and weaknesses. And ideally, if, if you're um, thinking of evaluating some mechanisms, you'll try to do all three in, in, in some appropriate uh, combination. So today, I'm going to be talking particularly about laboratory uh, experiments. Uh, but just, that's just one way of, uh, of evaluating mechanisms. So now I should turn to talk a little bit about actual, um, some actual reputation mechanisms, starting with some fairly simple cases, and then we'll, we'll move to some more realistic ones. The concept of reputation is often studied in um, a, a scenario that's thought of as a cooperation dilemma of, of, of some sort, where you have a group of people, and there's some notion of good behavior and bad behavior, however you, however you care to define that. And the good behavior has a benefit for the group as, as a whole, but it's costly to some individual, to, to all the individuals, actually. Um, either it's because they have a cost to, you know, to perform this beneficial action, um, or, or maybe in the, in the context of, say, privacy concerns, they might be worried about an indirect cost that if they participate by revealing their information, somehow it might be mis misused against them uh, later on. And so in a, in a scenario like this, everyone has a temptation to free ride on the efforts of others. That is, you'd like to say, I don't want to incur my individual cost, but I sure hope everyone else in the group will, uh, will participate so we can get this, the, the benefit for, for the group. Here's a very simple example that, that um, you might just think about if, if you've ever actually been in a situation like this. You're out you know, to dinner with a group of friends, and let's say you they're going to divide the cost afterwards equally. So what do you order? Cheap, expensive, compared to, what, compared to what everyone else is doing. And just, just think about it introspectively. Does it matter how big the group is? Usually if the larger group, you're a little bit more anonymous. Maybe um, you can get away with it. Do you expect to dine with these people again? Or, and, or at least or, or anytime soon? Just, you know, just thinking of those, those kind of questions and how they might impact what you think you would do or what you imagine other people uh, might do is a, a perfect example of this kind of cooperation dilemma in a very, in a very small and kind of personal um, uh, situation that we could probably all, all relate to. So this brings up the question of was you, um, what is the context in which a, a mechanism will be, will be used? Uh, again, will you interact with this group again, or is it a one-shot deal? Um, can you select what group you, you join? You know, may, some cases yes, some cases no. And if you're born in a certain country, you're a citizen of that country, you never selected it. Um, in, in, in other cases, you have to deliberately to select to be part of uh, some, some, some group or, or another, say, in, in picking what company you, you to work for. Can the group exclude you? Uh, sometimes yes, and, and, some, and sometimes no. So in this kind of very simplified scenario where everyone just has the, you know, basically one of two choices. I can either do the quote unquote good behavior or, or cooperate or the, the bad behavior or, or, or defect. Um, and your choice can just be based on what the other person's past behavior was. And it may be it's just a one-on-one -on -one transaction. Uh, maybe it's a one-on-many transaction as you imagine, that, say, this, this dinner example. Um, 
And one very simple kind of strategy that people have looked at quite a bit in this very restricted context that, that works pretty well is called tit for tat. So I'll do to you whatever you did to me last time. And if, if we're going to be um, interacting over and over again, um, that kind of simple retaliation in many cases can encourage people to behave, uh, to behave well. Another possibility is if the group can exclude people that have, um, have, this, have this bad behavior, uh, ostracism can be a powerful uh, uh, motivating um, tool. And so th these are, are, are a couple of, of approaches. But these simple scenarios, which have been studied both in the, in the context experimentally of what people do, they've been, they've been studied in um, having little computer-based agents that, that, play, uh, that play these games and, 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 and so on in many, many different, um, different, different situations. They often will have a perfect connection between what you decide, what you intend to do, and what actually you do do. So a connection between intent, which is what you're really after, and outcome and, and, and action. So generally, there be, will be no noise. Whereas in the real world, you could be a, you have well-intentioned, I'm going to get this package delivered to you, but my car has a flat tire. OK, I mean, it doesn't mean that I was trying to deceive you or anything. It's just bad luck. Um, so, you, so you can have situations where it makes it harder to evaluate if the package is late. Does it mean that you're a, a bad person, or does it mean that you just had some unlucky, uh, unlucky uh, situations? And of course, if, if you're willing to believe a sob story, people who have no sob story whatsoever might be tempted to just tell you one uh, anyway. Often these, these kind of simple scenarios don't give the agents or the, or the people a choice of who they're going to do, um, play this game with, or who, who they're going to be, their potential business partners will be. So right off the bat, you don't even have the option of, of ostracizing people. And finally, these, these simple situations generally do not have a market context, so you can't see how does the behavior that people choose and, and various mechanisms and strategies, how does it affect simple market um, properties such as price and, and the market efficiency and whether there are trades that would be beneficial that just don't, uh, that don't happen? And so that leads us to look at experiments that do have a more economic context um, to them, so they're more, are more, are more complicated. Um, and people basically have looked at two kinds here. Um, one is, is what we call agency trust games. And the other is a more of a full market um, scenario, which is what I'll be describing in what, what we did in our experiments. But let me just, just to show you the contrast, the idea of these agency trust games are some simple things like you have a pair of people, and one of them has a, gets a pot of money. And they can decide some of that to give to the other person. And then that other person multiplies that amount of money, say, by two or three. And then this second person, who's the agent, can give, choose give, to give some of it back. And they may choose to give none of it back. Okay. Or they could give all of it back. I mean, it's whatever, it's whatever their, their choice is. Um, and so there you have a, a concern about how much do you trust this agent. Um, we'd all be better off if I gave him all my money and it got doubled by this huge amount and then say he gives half of it back to me or, or, some, or something like that. Um, but of course, he could just take it all and, and run. And if I'm really worried about that, well, maybe I'll just keep what I have and, and uh, at least I get something. There have also been some experiments in, in a similar, look, uh, similar context of looking at agent uh, um, kind of decisions, looking at a one-sided market. Um, and this you can think of as you're hiring a, a contractor or you're hiring, say, a legal advisor or some, something, a scenario like that. You have some risk. You get a pot of money. You have some risk that you're going to lose it. If you want, you can pay the agent um, some, um, some amount to, to um, reduce the chance of, of your loss. Um, but the agent, in a sense, can work really hard or goof off. And those two cost the agent a different amount and give you a different, a different benefit. So how is it that you can gauge whether the agent will do what they promise to do, which of course will be, I'll work really hard on your behalf, so give me lots of money. Uh, and, and, and it will be really good for, for both of us. So that's another kind of a reputation context. And both of these people have looked at in uh, laboratory experiments. But I'd, what I'd like to turn to now is to describe some of the more full market scenarios that we've looked at um, in the last few years uh, at HP. Again, a fairly simple market-based scenario where you have both buyers and sellers, and both sides can decide not to fulfill their, their contract, and everyone can decide who they want to do business with. So it's a bit more like a, a real market um, uh, you know, scenario rather than these say, restrictive kinds of, of uh, cooperative dilemmas that you say find in people who study uh, you know, pairwise prisoners' dilemma and, and, and so on. 
And our goal was then to compare different information policies uh, and see what happens. What is it that people do? This kind of scenario, even though it's still quite restricted, um, is far too complicated to solve with game theory, in particular because it's hard to model what people believe about others. Um, and you can say what an ideal rational player who knows everyone else is rational and so on should do, um, but that's not necessarily what, what people actually do. So then I'd like to describe you know, a bit about the, the experimental setup and then, and then talk about uh, our, our results. So this is the HP um, Experimental Economics Lab. I want to describe to you, for, for those of you who haven't um, seen how these kind of experiments are set up, it's fairly simple. Uh, we get a group of, of people, usually they're Stanford students, um, t you know, 10 or 20 of them in, in for the afternoon. They're basically playing a, a computer game from, for real money. Um, and and here, here's the room. And um, we have this low-tech low anti-collusion devices. They're just big, big poster boards. And, and so for most of the, the experiments that we do, we, we, we want to control all the information that, you know, that, that people exchange. And we don't want them talking on the side and, and, and so on. And so this is our uh, simple technology for that, plus the, the, the announcement that if they get caught you know, talking when they, when they shouldn't be and so on, they're going to lose. Um, you know, the, the money that they, sh they should be earning in, in, the, in the experiment. So that works, that works pretty well, uh, but, but obviously not a very fancy technology. Now, how do we go about setting up one of these, these economic experiments? Again, the, con conceptually, it's, it's fairly simple. We ha we're going to set up some kind of market. We have a group of people. Say we divide them in half. Some are sellers and some are buyers. And for each seller, the experimenter gives a card like this. So you're a seller. and I, the experimenter, will give you and say, in this, for this particular seller, each, everyone will get different numbers. For this particular seller, I, the experimenter, will give you one unit to sell, and it'll cost you $5. And you can have two units, and it'll cost you $15, and, and, and so on. Generally set up with, in this kind of scenario where each extra unit costs a little bit more. It doesn't have to be that way. Um, but that models the idea of increasing marginal costs in um, many kind of production tasks. Conversely, if you're a buyer, the experimenter goes to you and gives you a little card like this and says, if at the end of the experiment, you buyer who start out with nothing, with no units, if you give me one unit, I'll give you $10. And if you give me two units, I'll give you $12, say. OK, and so everyone gets this card. It's private information. They don't you know, they don't know what, what everyone else gets. Um, and in this particular context, for these two people, you can see that they do have an opportunity for a profitable trade, that is, if there's, if there's one unit that, that, that transacts at some price between $5 and $10, then the seller, let's say it's at $7, well, the seller gets, gets $7 for this unit and has to pay $5 to the experimenter to get it, to therefore a profit of $2. Similarly, the buyer gets the unit, has to pay $7 for it, but gets $10 from the experimenter, so a $3 profit for the buyer. So that's an example where there could be a profitable trade, assuming these, these people could find it. But in this particular example, again, if these were just the only two people involved, there would not be any profit for exchanging a second unit in this case. It would cost $15 for the seller to get two units, and it's only worth, at most, $12 to, to the buyer. So this is an example of then how you go about setting up an economic experiment. You give this sort of information to each of the participants, and then they play a computer game which embodies whatever mechanism that you're, you're trying to test out. You know, like, like a stock market auction or, or whatever, or in our case, uh, a reputation um, method. But this is how we induce supply and demand that we as the experimenters know ahead of time um, what it is. So in, in our experiment, we had multiple buyers and sellers in a market. Um, we allowed the players to restrict who it is they would allow um, their, their trades to, um, who it is they would either buy from or, or, or sell to if they wish to do so. Um, the particular mechanism was a discrete double auction. So this is similar to what goes on in, in, in the, say, the stock market. It might be unfamiliar to you um, if, if you're thinking of, of, sort of just the normal one-sided auctions, like in an art auction or, or, or something you see, you see particularly say, in the movies. In a double auction, at any time, a seller can, say, post uh, a price or accept one that a buyer has already um, uh, declared and, and, vice, and vice versa. So going back to this, um, this example here, you know, it might start out that the seller, of course, doesn't know how much things might be of value to the, to the buyer. And maybe the, so the seller says, well, look, I'll sell one unit for $20. And 
just sort of sits around waiting and doesn't see any buyers taking up that you know, taking up that offer. And you know, so then the, the seller might have to lower lower the price. But because it's a double auction, at the same time a buyer can say, well, look, I will buy a unit for three dollars. You know, and then the seller looks at that and says, well, I don't like that. Uh, maybe I will either post you know post another one. Maybe I'll say, okay, eventually I'll sell it for seven dollars, and the buyer could think, well, should I take it? I can make a profit on that, or should I hold out for something you know for something better? Um, maybe another buyer is going to take it. You know, I have to w weigh all those um, you know, w weigh all those those considerations. But that's how a double auction works. It's both and both parties can can make offers, and either and either side can just pounce on one and accept it if if they like it. We chose that not particularly because it's the only you know, best kind of auction, but it, it's well known experimentally that that sort of auction it equilibrates very quickly. We were not interested in this particular experiment to look at how long it takes to get to market equilibrium or, or different you know, auction mechanisms. Yeah. Did you filter the participants for not having participated in this kind of experiment before? Um, not in this case, no. Okay. So I'm concerned about uh, if they haven't participated in this kind of experiment before. Mm -hmm. Then they have essentially some, some statistical expectation about mm -hmm. what range of differences in prices might be. Mm -hmm. Well, so, so, so they might actually have economic experience, but what we, we I haven't told you sort of all the details of this, but we did announce ahead of time the overall supply and demand. So what you didn't know is who had you know, necessarily the, the best price and so on. And so what we were, and we again we did that particularly because we we wanted the market to converge quickly. And we were looking at how is it people make decisions on who to do business with. Okay. And what changed from time to time is who had, say, the good deals and the bad deals. You wouldn't know that. Um, but the overall, the aggregate supply and demand st stayed, stayed the same in this, in this particular experiment. But, that, but that's a good point. Um, OK, so in addition to the market, what made this an interesting from a reputation point of view is that people, after they've accepted some uh, exchange. They said, "Okay, I'm willing to you know sell this for seven dollars." After that part's all over, there was an additional decision round for for this particular game, where each person could decide whether they were going to fulfill their their contract or not. And they, everybody does this simultaneously, and, and with, you know without knowing what everybody else um, is is going to do. So in the, in this case, the buyer says, "Look, I promise to send seven dollars, you know, give you seven dollars, but if if I keep the seven dollars, I'm seven dollars richer, and I could still get the unit if you send if you give it to me." And similarly, the, the seller had to make that decision. Do I give the unit? It's going to cost me, say, $5 to give it to, the, to, the, to, to buy it from the experimenter. And if I don't give the unit, I don't have to pay that $5. And I keep it at the end of the, end of the day. So that's where the, 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 the issue of cooperation or defection uh, or trust uh, and so on comes in in this particular, um, this particular experiment. And then we just repeated this several times in different scenarios and different groups of students over you know, different days and so on. But that's, that's the, the, the context of the experiment. So that's the setup. And now what we wanted to look at is, you know, is one particular um, issue for, for reputation mechanisms is what about how much information that you have. And there's many ways that we could do this. But again, in a nice laboratory setting, we have a lot of control over what this information is. And so we looked basically at three different information policies. Number one was when you were going to potentially trade with someone, all you knew is how they treated you personally in the past. Okay? Did they fulfill contracts or not with you? That's all you knew. Um, and that's sort of the low information um, context, context. And this you might think of is if you had no real reputation mechanism or information aggregation to, to aid you, all you might know is, I've gone to this person before, and I've either had good experiences or bad experiences. Um, and then I make, I make my decision based, based on that. The other extreme, we call the high information um, scenario, you also you have your the personal history, of course. Um, but we also presented to people um, how much of the, the, their prior contracts with everybody in the, in the group did they fulfill in, over the course, the course of the experiment. And we told people that this information was accurate. So we, as the experimenters, were, were providing this, this information. And um, you know, therefore, they, 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 knew it, they knew it was an accurate um, uh, uh, you know, um, representation of, of what actually of what actually happened. What they chose to do with that information was was their was their business. And then a third case, which is motivated a lot by the eBay um, rating rating system, is a self-reporting feedback mechanism. Again, you have your personal experience, and now what we allowed people to do is give a score to every transaction. Did they like it or not like it? Okay, um, plus or minus, you know, one one or zero. 
And what we presented to everyone when they were making their decisions on who they might want to enter into contracts with is the score that they got from all people that they've had, had transactions with in the past. Now, if everybody reported accurately, then this score would be the same as this high, um, this, this high information case. Uh, but of course, they don't have to report out. They just say whatever they, they say whatever they want. And so this was an example where this kind of, if, if let's say you needed to do the high information case in order to get things to work well, but then you say, well, that's really costly. You have to have someone that can verify all the information and so on. Could you get away with just a self-reporting mechanism? Would that work you know, more or less as well, or is it completely terrible? Yes. How, excuse do, I, me? do I know that if you gave me bad feedback? You mean in the past or now? Okay. No, so this all happens in. So, so we made a transaction. Right. And you rated me that I didn't fill it. Do I mm -hmm. get that information? No, you're just, you're just showing aggregate. You, so you know your aggregate score. But uh, what other gave me? Well, you, know, you don't necessarily know, not individually, but you know your aggregate score. Okay. And, and so, oh, say at the very beginning, you, you could see if you wanted to how, how that changed. Um, and so that actually is an, is an interesting kind of extra variation. We could look at a little bit more on do, you know, breaking out that kind of detail. Would that, would that matter? People could have various kind of punishment strategies. Um, and yeah, so, so the, again, so these are, are three choices that, that, that we did. Um, and there, there are plenty more you know, other interesting ones, too. In these experiments, the only failure, the only you know, way people could choose if you like not, not to cooperate is by not fulfilling their, their contracts. In this context, it's like everybody agrees on what makes good behavior versus bad behavior. It's not like, say, movie recommendations, where you can get a recommendation from someone and you think, oh, this is the greatest recommendation and I'll always listen to this person. Someone else gets the same recommendation because their taste in movies is, is quite different. They say, oh, those are terrible recommendations. I'm never going to listen um, to those. That would be a different kind of, of a reputation context when it depends partly on different people evaluating what a transaction, what it means to be a good or bad transaction. In this context, it's simpler. That is, everyone agrees that if you get money, it's better than not getting the money. And if you get a promised good, it's better than not getting it. Um, so it's a much simpler um, context in which the reputation uh, take, takes place. But not, that's not to say that's the only in, uh, um, kind of situation in which, in which reputation uh, is important. So let me talk a little bit about um, our, our results. We looked a bit at aggregate behaviors, that is, how did it affect the market, and then a little bit more uh, at individual behaviors. Um, and I'll just, I'll just go through these. And if you have any that are, that are particularly interesting to you, um, you know, we can stop and spend a bit more time on them. So here is what we saw with um, aggregate market statistics. And we don't really have a good understanding of why this happened. And, and we, we've tried a number of, of, of simple, um, simple kinds of models and haven't been able to find a good one yet. Um, but basically, what we see is that you have different amounts of fulfillment in different parts of the experiment. The price pretty much stays around what the, we as the experimenters know should be the equilibrium, according to economic theory and, and, and so on. Um, but the trading volume. Um, has, has a rather different kind of behavior. And that is, when fulfillment is low, the volume of, of contracts people enter, to, enter into is higher, you know, possibly because they think, well, I don't expect anyone to fulfill it. Maybe I have to, to um, have a lot of contracts, but I don't have to fulfill them either, or, or whatever. We don't know what's going on in their heads that would explain consistently all these, uh, all these, these three um, aggregate, aggregate statistics. And so that's, that's an interesting open uh, uh, question. And the, the third one is what we, we call market efficiency. And that's basically the question is, at the end of the day, how much of the money that the experimenter that we had on the table for them did they go home with? And so ideally, if every case where there was, say, a $5 that could match with the $10 in that supply and demand, if every case had a transaction, so they went home with as much money as they could extract out of the experimenters as possible, then that, that would be a high efficiency case. Yeah. Uh, your graph on efficiency shows dots above 100%. Mm -hmm. What does that mean? So is that a, a, um, I guess, I, I guess I didn't, didn't mention it. We also had noise in this experiment. So, so sometimes this is to distinguish between intent and delivery. So sometimes you could intend to deliver something, and like 10% of the time, it would just disappear in the mail. Okay. Uh, so this theoretical efficiency is with respect to the average noise. Now, in some experiments, it could just be you're lucky to have a little bit less noise than this 10% just by the flip of the coin. And, so, and if lots of people fulfill, in that case, you can be, uh, you can be a bit higher. This question always comes up. And I'm really trying to think of there should be some simple way of, uh, you know, of, of explaining that. But it, I, but it, it turns out it's, it's good. You can see if anyone pay, is paying attention of how can efficiency um, be, be above 100%. And so it's really what's in the denominator there. Good, good question. Was that? 
your, your question as well. So the, the market efficiency um, was, was really quite high when, when fulfillment was high. And one, one reason for this is that the, the, the contracts that were not fulfilled um, tended to be ones that would not trade in equilibrium anyway. And, and so per, you know, perhaps someone really made a really good deal. And the reason it's a good deal is because they didn't intend to fulfill it. You know, maybe. We don't know, again, what's going on in, in, inside people, people's heads. But that transaction should not have happened anyway if, if the market was, were really efficient and everyone was rational. Um, so that kind of unfulfilled contract results in a wealth transfer. That is, someone gets money that the other person you know, maybe should have had. Um, but it doesn't change the amount that we, as the experimenters or the market as a whole, um, uh, you know, gets gets from the trade. So there are other things besides efficiency that are important for for, for markets. Um, but um, that's that is one of the things that, that we observed happening for in the, the high fulfillment case. And here's here's an example. I'd like to show you just a little bit of um, you know, of, of data of what what actually happened. So we say in this case run, ran the experiments um, for 12 to 12 to 16 times, and you see toward the end. Although they don't, we don't announce the end of the game until uh, two periods ahead of time, people know that when the clock's getting near 5 PM, it's getting near the end of the, end of the, uh, of the game. And so what you see here, of course, is toward the end of the game, there's, there's, I have no benefit from having a high reputation. We're, I'm not going to be playing with these you know, people much anymore. So hey, I might as well take the money and run. And so, so every, everyone knows that. And we just we sort of see this, this whole, whole crash um, here. And so it's fortunate that we were able to run the thing, experiments long enough to at least see some discrimination um, early, early on. You know, one thing that rational players could say is, well, look, I know at the very end no one's going to bother to fulfill, because they're not going to care about reputation. And so the, the time before that, there's no point in fulfilling, because even if I have a high reputation, they're not going to give me anything anyway. And you just backwardly in, induce that and say, well, I shouldn't do any fulfillment in the beginning. Uh, in, in some sense, that's a, a, a nice prediction of rational game theory. It's not what people do. Um, and, you know, and it's fortunate for them because they can walk home with more money um, than if they didn't do any trades at all. We also had a look at self-reporting accuracies, which turned out to be very high in this, in this experiment. Um, so over 90% of the, of, the, of the cases, people reported a transaction, whether it was good or bad, based on what actually happened in that, in that transaction. But the inaccurate cases have a high bias toward bad reports. And, and again, we don't know why um, this, this is. Maybe people are punishing for things that happened further in the past, or, or, or um, they're just upset about things, or, or they're trying to, you know, who, know, who knows what. Um, I don't understand the second bullet. The inaccurate cases, just find them somewhere? So if we look here, there's the cases of what actually happened. You received your money or good, and you, or you didn't receive it. And this is what rating you gave. Did I say it was a good thing or, or, or not? So the accurate ones are here and here. You received it. You said you, you, it was good. Here are the, are the inaccurate ones. I did not receive it, but I said it was good transaction, and, and, and vice versa. And we just see that this box tends to be bigger than that box. And you know, it's, again, it's an observation. You don't have a good, you know, a good reason um, you know, for that. We also saw some um, behaviors that are similar to what I, I described to you with um, some of the earlier, simpler um, situations. We did see some evidence of, of tit for tat. People would punish by not fulfilling um, with, with contracts um, with, with people who had, um, in, in essence, didn't fulfill their contracts in, in the past. And so from these experiments, we can get both information about market behavior. We can compare different in information policies and get some idea of, of individual behavior. And we do find that information policy is a strong determinant of how well the market um, works. At least in this co context, self-reporting was pretty much as good as uh, high uh, information, although it has some biased errors. And non-fulfillment was occasionally used as, as retaliation. Now, more recently, we've also done some comparisons with uh, a particular website. So I mentioned there are these, these different uh, approaches to evaluating mechanisms, game theory, field studies, and, and laboratory experiments. Um, Prosper.com is a simple micro, microfinance website, um, which involves getting lots of people to aggregate together to loan money to, um, you know, to people that would have a hard time getting it, say, from banks or, or have to pay high interest rates. And we were comparing what we saw in our experiment with what sort of we saw with evident, evidence of happening on, on, on Prosper. And then also, just, just for comparison, like to see what happens with these much simpler models that I talked about, these simple scenarios. Uh, and 
in particular, we see when we compare with the simple scenarios, they don't allow people to do a lot of interesting behavior. So you can't see it even, even if you wanted to. You don't have the ability to exclude and, and, and so on. Um, one interesting thing, we didn't see evidence in our experiments of price discrimination. That is, I like, could give a bad deal to someone that has a low reputation, and maybe they're desperate enough that they have to take it. Uh, we didn't, we didn't see evidence of that. We saw a lot more evidence of, of people just ostracized and don't refuse to do business with, um, with, with people. But it's interesting to compare what do our experiments do, do with, with what happens in, in um, some, some field studies. A variety of open issues. It would be nice to have a comprehensive theory that describes how these different mechanisms work in practice with real people. Um, how might people use strategic um, re reporting? What about specialization? If, there's, if different um, people are somewhat more in monopolistic um, uh, you know, situations. Could they afford to have a lower reputation but people have to um, deal with them anyway? What about identity change? You have a bad reputation, you just sort of go offline for a while and log back in with a new name. And how do people connect, you know, connect that up? Um, can you make use of networks of trust that we devise, in, say, in, in social networks so that you, you value reputation reports from your friends more than just some random stranger who might be the friend of, of the, the other person, and you don't, you don't know that? There's a variety of broader issues. Um, going back to the, the, the three approaches that I mentioned in, in, in trying to in, encourage good behavior, finding combinations of technology, mechanisms, and public policy. How does that depend on, on culture? And um, I would just like to um, point out, if you're interested in this, there's, there's a, a couple of good books that describe a bit more of the um, policy uh, context around some, some of these issues. Um, and both these people are really great speakers, if you ever have an opportunity to, to, um, to hear them, um, that look a lot at the social and, and, and policy issues, with the emphasis being it's not just technology. Technology enables a lot of new things, gives us new problems, new capabilities, new opportunities, but it's important to keep in mind uh, the, the, the context. And these are, are, are two um, places that you might, might find that uh, helpful. OK, and so if you have any questions? Yeah, the game you played, is, uh, how many of the players went home with quite a bit more money than the other players? Or was the money one fairly easy? Um, typically, the, the range in, in our experiments was about 75 to $150. Um, and so that would be about the, about the range. What they would, um, and yeah, some people have either better luck or better traders or, or, or for whatever reason. So, so that, that's the range. In, in this, yeah, in this, in this, so that was the range in this, okay. in this particular experiment. Yeah, pretty much. What about distribution? Is the question about the distribution? Yeah, what I felt was Oh, it's pretty much like a bell, like a bell curve, the, but not in all experiments, and just in this, in this particular one. That, yeah, it's like that. Did, did you see any attempts at signaling behavior, like signaling through the, the offers and that sort of thing? No. Uh, I mean, there certainly could have been, but not, not anything that, that, um, that, that we saw. Outside of the experiments, mm -hmm. do you have any? Uh, stories or uh, examples of signaling behavior that exists through, let's say, on eBay or well, I mean, there are I mean, some, some examples of, in much larger scale auctions of um, companies using some digits of their prices to signal to their competitors what they should or shouldn't be bidding. Uh, and you know, the question is, you could design experiments that try to pick those those kind of thing those kind of things out too, or, or situations in which that would be um, profitable. And in this in this context, the amount of time that people have, we give them about a couple minutes per round and so on. Um, plus, they don't um, have a chance ahead of time to sort of sit in the back room and decide, you know, hey, this is what we should do. Uh, makes makes that harder. But you certainly could have situations like that. So I guess then related to that is you had um, in this experiment. Uh, prevented collusion. Mm -hmm. We tried to, yeah. In the real world, uh, are there phenomena now of sort of side channels? And, and mm -hmm. is that happening where there is sort of broad collusion among people who may have these kind of black networks um, to, to try to? Well, they don't. They don't tell anyone. But the but what there what there is and certainly is is side discussions. So you, you, it's another way of sharing reputation information. Um, yeah, and, and so you might say, well, I'm thinking of doing business with this person. Is there anyone else that has done? So I actively seek information. You can, you can have side conversations um, you know, like, like that. It's another thing the internet facilitates. Uh, and of course, you can read things that people say that may or may not be true. And you have to make, you have to make an evaluation uh, on, you know, on, on that as well. Thank you. Anything else? OK. Well, thank thanks, thanks for your time. Thank you. Thank you.